Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Rick Feinberg, AAS Press Officer. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the eighth and final press briefing of this 225th meeting of the American Astronomical Society in Seattle, Washington. If you have a cell phone or beeper, pager, etc., please silence it so it doesn't go off in the middle of the briefing. And we are webcasting, so I need to remind everybody, um, I, I forgot to mention to you guys, please make sure you always speak into the mic so that the webcast folks can hear. And when we get to the Q&A, of course, I'll ask you to wait for the microphone. Uh, the webcast folks should start queuing up questions as they occur to them uh, via the text chat. So today's briefing is a little bit of a potpourri. I entitled it Predictions and Probabilities. Some of the speakers will be uh, talking about predictions made and predictions confirmed, and others will be talking about predictions made and predictions unconfirmed. Uh, and then uh, a couple of talks that originally fit that theme really well ended up going away. So it's a little bit of a mix. But all four of the results are very interesting and fascinating and will potentially uh, result in, in a little bit of a brain twister near the end. So we have four speakers, and they are Dayton Jones from the Jet Propulsion Lab, who will be speaking on an, giving us an update on very long baseline array astrometry of Cassini. That is the Cassini spacecraft, not the scientist who's been dead for several hundred years now. <laughs> Adam Miller, also from the Jet Propulsion Lab, will follow with a machine learning method to infer fundamental stellar properties. Bryce Menard from Johns Hopkins will speak on a map of mysterious molecules shedding new light on a century-old puzzle. And finally, Robert Nemiroff from Michigan Technological University, but who many of you will know as one of the co-editors and co-founders of the astronomy picture of the day, will give us a little bit of a brain twist with superluminal sweeping spot pair events in astronomical settings. And with that, I will turn the podium over to our first speaker, Dayton Jones. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. So I'm presenting this update on behalf of the people you see here, a team of scientists at Caltech's Jet Propulsion Laboratory and the National Radio Astronomy Observatory. And just to remind you, the Cassini spacecraft launched almost 18 years ago now. It's a major mission, one of NASA's flagship missions. You can uh, judge the size of the spacecraft by the people there on the left and arrived in Saturn and went into Saturn orbit uh, just over 10 years ago in 2004. So this is just a diagram to indicate the complexity of the orbits that Cassini has been making around Saturn, views as seen from above and, and from the side. And the reason for this complicated pattern is simply to allow all of the close flybys of the Saturnian moons and the observations of Saturn's atmosphere from different angles now, during this, this whole complicated dance, the Deep Space Network continually tracks the spacecraft and measures the uh, Doppler and range. And from that, they can determine the location of Cassini with respect to the center of mass of the Saturnian system very accurately. But that tells us nothing about where Saturn is in inertial space. It's a completely local solution for the orbit of the spacecraft about the planet. To improve the planetary ephemeris, we need to know the positions of the planets as well as we can in an inertial reference frame. So what we've done is combined the DSN orbital solutions with interferometric measurements of the position of Cassini with respect to a grid of very distant radio quasars. And this is done with the National Radio Astronomy's Observatory's Very Long Baseline Array, the premier instrument in the world for doing this kind of very high resolution observing. This just indicates what the VLBA is. It's 10 radio antennas spread across um, North America from the Virgin Islands to Hawaii. And because of its large geographic extent, it has the ability to measure, well, it has the ability to make very high resolution images. But for this study, the critical thing it can do is measure very precise angles. And so we're using this to measure the, the position of the Cassini spacecraft against extragalactic distant quasars, and that tells us where Cassini is in the extragalactic reference frame, the inertial reference frame. Combining that with the DSN orbital tracking, we now know where the center mass of Saturn is in that same inertial reference frame, and that is the data that's useful for improving the planetary ephemeris. 
This is just an example of the, the quality of the results to date over the past decade. These, these are showing the difference between the measured positions for the center of mass of the Saturnian system compared to the current best fit for the orbit of Saturn as part of the ongoing JPL planetary ephemeris development program. So if everything were perfect, all these residuals would be zero. And, you know, since it's reality, they're not quite, but they're very small. Uh, you'll notice the, the y-axis there are in milli arc seconds, so a thousandth of a second of arc. And consequently, the, uh, the scatter here is, is a small fraction of a milli arc second in both right ascension, the top plot, and in declination, the lower plot. Now, what does that actually mean? I mean, milli arc seconds are small, but, but just to sort of put it in a more <laughs> general context, it, it's the width of a dime at 2,000 miles. Or, or in a more relevant uh, context here, it's a linear scale of about one mile at the typical distance of Saturn. So this is, this is very good and far better than, than previous techniques have been able to uh, provide. And again, it, it's really made possible by the VLBA and, and its extraordinary precision. So why do people care? People care because getting better orbits, better positions, and therefore better orbits for the planets, and particularly for the two planets that dominate the dynamics of our solar system, Jupiter and Saturn, improves the entire ephemeris, which is the basis for dynamical studies of the solar system, for the predictions of occultations and eclipse events, for it's the basis for pulsar timing measurements, because those are critically dependent on the, on the Earth's orbit. And of course, JPL's primary interest in it's, is that it's essential for navigating interplanetary spacecraft. Um, Cassini is our first opportunity to get this sort of high precision data for any gas giant planet. You may recall, many of you, that the Galileo spacecraft uh, orbited Jupiter for several years um, some time ago. However, Galileo's high gain antenna failed to deploy, and consequently, its signal was extremely weak. It was not possible to make these types of interferometric measurements of Galileo to anywhere to within an order of magnitude of the precision we're able to get now for Cassini. But all is not lost as far as Jupiter is concerned. We have a mission on the way to Jupiter, which will go into Jupiter orbit and spend a year orbiting the planet in uh, mid-2016. Uh, mid and we plan to use this exact same technique with the very long baseline array combined with DSN tracking of the Juno spacecraft in orbit about Jupiter to provide better positions and therefore a better orbit for Jupiter in the future. Thanks. I should, I should have said that Adam, Adam will now do the, uh, the second presentation. All right, so as you heard a moment ago, my name is Adam Miller, and I'm a postdoc at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory now. And today I'm going to tell you about some exciting results that came out in the AppJ today uh, about a new method that we've developed to infer fundamental stellar properties using photometric light curves of stellar variables. Astronomy is currently undergoing a revolution where we're collecting unprecedented amounts of data. The reason for this is that the cost of computers and astronomical detectors has been falling very rapidly over the last decade. And so an uh, initial example of where we are today uh, is that the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, or SDSS, has actually obtained images of more than one billion different sources on the night sky. And that same survey has also obtained more than four million spectra. These numbers are numbers that would have been completely unheard of 20 years ago. And that and other surveys are continuing to progress now, ultimately with the culmination of something that's called the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, or LSST. LSST is a very large 8-meter telescope that's going to be located in Chile. And it's such a large and fast survey machine that it will literally run out of sky. LSST will be able to observe the entire southern sky in three nights' time. So what do you do if you've actually run out of sky? Well, one option is to go back and image the sky again. And that is precisely what LSST will do. So they will repeatedly take images of the entire sky as visible from the southern hemisphere. Uh, and as a result, they will have measurements of the brightness uh, variations of anything that you can see from the south. 
Uh, and so that is the, the, the topic of what I'm going to be talking about today, something that's known as variable stars, or stars whose brightness changes as a function of time. So all in all, LSST is expected to find something like 20 billion different sources, and about 50 million of those are going to be variable stars. Uh, if a human being wanted to sit down and actually look at each of those variable stars and decide what those things are, that would take them roughly 47 years without a break to eat, sleep, or use the restroom. So that's something that's not really a tractable problem. So I'm going to tell you how we use machine learning to actually deal with something like this. When your volume of data becomes very, very large and humans can no longer interact with it, machine learning provides a nice way for you to actually figure out what is going on with your data. Uh, machine learning is a way that you can compare two observables or compare two data sets uh, using a machine algorithm without actually writing down an explicit equation that, that maps from one set to the other. And there's actually many examples of machine learning that you probably encounter every day uh, during your life. Uh, one is the post office used to actually have a large workforce of people that would actually read every single envelope that they receive, and then they would place that envelope in the corresponding box to go to the correct zip code. Today, there's computers that read every single piece of mail that's received by the USPS, including those that are handwritten in poor writing, and the computers can read that mail, figure out what the zip code is, and automatically forward the mail onto the correct location. Another example is the popular movie streaming uh, company Netflix, who can look at what movies you've watched and enjoyed in the past and compare that to their large database of users in order to make predictions about what, say, romantic comedies you may want to watch on the upcoming weekend. And so we're hoping to apply similar techniques to our astronomical data. In particular, it's very expensive to, abstain, to obtain uh, spectroscopy of stars. Uh, these days, obtaining photometry or light curves is much, much cheaper, and so we're hoping to use this cheaper method to infer properties that normally can only be obtained with spectra. So the first step is we're going to repeatedly take several images of the same portion of the sky, so we want to look at the same stars and galaxies again and again and again. And then in each of those images, we're going to measure the brightness uh, of, a, say, a star that we're interested in, and that will enable us to project what is the brightness fluctuations of that star as a function of time, or something that's known uh, within the community as a light curve. We can then measure the properties of those light curves, things like how large is the amplitude of fluctuations, or what is the characteristic time scale for variations. And all in all, we actually end up measuring 66 different properties. And we can use those to describe the star and try to then map that onto what we would learn from a spectrum. So uh, an important aspect of every machine learning model is that you have to train the model. So you need at least some subset of data where you know the answer before you actually initiate your algorithm. So we obtained 9,000 spectra of stars so that we could measure their temperature, their size, and the amount of heavy elements that are present in their atmosphere. And so we allowed the machine to then train on these 9,000 stars using both light curves and spectra to try to map from light curve properties to spectra, spectral properties. In the end, this is what we found. I'm showing three plots here with our predictions shown along the vertical axis and the spectroscopically measured properties shown along the horizontal axis. And if we did a perfect job, you would see the diagonal lines uh, in each of these plots. All of our predictions would be located right along that line. While we're not perfect, it turns out we actually do a pretty good job. Um, our typical scatter or the typical uncertainty from our prediction method is uh, comparable for temperature, size, and heavy element content of the star to what you would get from a low resolution spectrum. Now this is actually a result that's quite profound because, as I said before, spectroscopy is very expensive to obtain, whereas uh, photometric surveys like LSST can make a light curve of a star uh, just in the natural order of business. And so for those 50 million variable stars that LSST will detect, which I mentioned earlier, the, our machine learning method will actually turn LSST into a pseudo-spectrograph. For those 50 million stars, we'll be able to measure their spectroscopic properties. So this is very exciting because this will provide us uh, a window into uh, constructing extremely detailed maps of the Milky Way. So we'll be able to identify new structures and understand essentially how metallicity propagates throughout our galaxy. So how are new stars forming and how are they moving after they've formed? 
So uh, to conclude, uh, I want to remind you that we have this goal of being able to predict the typically expensive to obtain properties uh, of stars, their temperature, their size, and the metal content in the atmosphere of those stars from photometric light curves, which routinely now are being collected by many surveys, and there will be exquisite light curves eventually produced by the LSST. So to do this, we had identified a number of variable sources from the famous uh, Sloan Digital Sky Survey Stripe 82 region. We were then able to obtain 9,000 spectra for variable stars in order to train our algorithm, um, which is essential for us to then make predictions. Uh, after we built our model, there was another 50,000 variable stars in the Stripe 82 region of SDSS where we were able to make predictions for what the temperature, size, and metal content of those stars was uh, using the model trained on the 9,000 sources with spectra. And so in the end, we were able to actually demonstrate that this machine learning method is capable of, to some degree, replacing the expensive spectroscopic observations that uh, have been made in the past. So in the future, uh, we hope to make all sky maps of the metallicity of stars and understand better structures that are present throughout our galaxy. Uh, just real last, in closing, I want to thank my collaborators on this project, in particular Josh Bloom, who was my thesis advisor at UC Berkeley. I also want to thank NASA for awarding me a Hubble postdoctoral fellowship, which has supported me during a lot of this, uh, a lot of the, the time that I did this research, as well as uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and Caltech, who have hosted me during that time. So thank you, and I will uh, pass it on for our third talk today. All right, good afternoon. I am uh, Brice Menard from Johns Hopkins University, and I'm very pleased to be here today to show you some new exciting results about mysterious molecules in our galaxy, molecules that have been puzzling astronomers for about a century. So let's set up the stage. This is an image of our galaxy, of a galaxy that looks very much like our own galaxy. And when we see such a system, we like to ask the question, what is it, what is it made of? What is our own galaxy being made of? We have some ideas of what the answer to this question is, and this is a summary of what it is here. This is a list of all the ingredients that we find in our galaxy, and they are ordered as a function of size. So on the left, we start with the most simple atoms, the hydrogen atoms, and then we increase in complexity and size. We have small and large molecules. Then we find uh, some small grains that form what we call cosmic dust. We have rocks, then planets, and at the end of the spectrum, we find stars in our own galaxy. In order to understand the system as a whole for each of these ingredients, we need to ask some very basic questions. Where are they located and how much of this material we find out there in space? To answer these questions, there, are, there is a very simple way. We can just go and look. So let's see what we find. Let's start with the most simple objects here, the stars. What we can do very simply using telescopes on the ground, Using light in the visible and the near infrared, we can map out the entire distribution of stars in the sky, and this is how it looks. So what you are seeing here are all the stars in our galaxy, the Milky Way. We can do the same for different uh, components of the galaxy. We can focus on these small grains. We know that they are very bright at infrared wavelengths. So by looking at the sky at those wavelengths using space telescopes, we can see where those tiny little grains are distributed. As shown in this picture, you can see that overall the distribution is very different from that of the stars. And we can continue this game for different components. We can focus on the small molecules. This is an example showing here uh, the distribution of carbon monoxide in our galaxy. As you can see, these tiny molecules are confined to the plane of the galaxy, and not that many of them exist outside of this uh, galactic disk. We can do the same for hydrogen, which is the most abundant component in the galaxy. This can be observed from the ground using radio telescopes, and this is how the overall distribution looks like. So this is great. Uh, we now have a very nice collection of maps. This is summarizing work that has been done by several teams over the past 20 years. And having this collection, we can now combine the knowledge that we are getting from all these maps to come up with a global understanding of our galaxy, what it is made of, uh, how it was formed, and how it's evolving. But this is not the end of the story. There is actually one missing piece to this puzzle. There is this little dark corner of astronomy which corresponds to the world of large molecules. It turns out that we know very little about these large molecules. So for example, we do not have a map that allows us to know where they are located, that allows us to tell how much of these molecules 
uh, we find in different regions of the sky. So from the observational point of view, it has been very difficult uh, to come up with an understanding of these um, populations of uh, molecules. And we can also, we might want to say, okay, what about attacking the problem from a theoretical point of view? Here, again, it's very difficult. It turns out that the complexity in trying to quantify the behavior and observational signatures of all these different ingredients, that complexity is the highest in the regime of large molecules. We uh, can use quantum calculations to predict the behavior and the observational signatures of atoms and small molecules, but those calculations become extremely complex uh, when we reach the regime of large molecules, to the point that we don't even have computers that are powerful enough to be able to conduct such calculations. Interestingly, as we move on to larger objects in the macroscopic world, the calculations become then more simple uh, as we move from microscopic to the macroscopic world, and we no longer need uh, quantum physics to describe the objects. So let's focus on these large molecules. If we try to imagine what kind of molecules uh, could live out there in space, we know that there is a whole sea of molecules. There are thousands and thousands of different molecules that could be there in space, but we know very little about them. We don't know which of those molecules are the most abundant. We don't know which ones get destroyed first, which ones live the longest. Uh, we are quite ignorant when it comes to this world. But there is one thing that we know about this molecule. We know that some of them can imprint some tiny little features in the light from stars. This is not new. This has been observed for a long time. Um, it goes back to 1922 when an astronomer discovered uh, the first of such features. Astronomers call them the diffuse interstellar bands. And what happens is that when some of these molecules are in front of stars, they can remove a little bit of the light of these stars. And if we look at the intensity of light as a function of wavelengths, which is shown in this picture, we have these little dips that appear at specific locations, specific wavelengths. They are very weak. On average, they, are about, uh, they have an amplitude of about 1%, but we know exactly where they appear. Astronomers have seen them for now almost one century. However, so far, nobody has been able to understand the connection between all these little features, these little wiggles, and which molecules are responsible uh, for these uh, signatures. Uh, this is one of the longest open questions in astronomy. We are seeing the fingerprint of something, but we are not able to identify which, what is this something, which molecules are responsible for this effect. So now let me tell you a few words on how we detect these molecules. Uh, so as I said, they imprint some tiny little wiggles in the spectra of stars. The figure here shows the different types of stellar spectra that we can find in the sky. So this is showing the intensity of light as a function of wavelengths for different types of stars, from hot stars, very hot stars, all the way to cool stars. As you can see, the spectra look very different. The spectra of hot stars are very simple. They are very smooth, and if we want to detect tiny little features that are at the 1% level, those would be the candidates of choice. And indeed, indeed, this is the types of stars that people have been using for now 80 to 90 years in order to detect these diffuse interstellar bands because it's much easier. However, by doing so, they have limited themselves to looking only at a tiny fraction of stars. We only have one out of 10,000 stars that are hot enough to have such spectra. Therefore, by taking this approach, we limit ourselves to looking only at a few specific locations in the sky, and we do not have access to a global view of where these molecules are distributed. So for the past few years at Johns Hopkins University, we have developed some new techniques to be able to detect these uh, little wiggles in the spectra much better, and we now have enough technology to be able to detect them in virtually all types of stellar spectra. So suddenly, instead of being limited to these few types, uh, these few lines of sight in the sky, we can make use of all the stars that are available to us. And our technique can also be applied not only to stars, but in addition to galaxies and quasar spectra. So in short, we can suddenly make use of all the objects we can observe in the sky to detect uh, these mysterious molecules. So now I'm going to show you what we find, and this is uh, the first time this entire map is going to be shown. So first, here we are showing the stars in the Milky Way that we can see at optical and near infrared wavelengths. And now in order to extract this information about mysterious molecules, we are going to make use of data from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. So this is an observational campaign that has been going on for the past 15 years. 
and has observed a pretty large fraction of the sky. So what you see in white here are all these regions where we have spectroscopic data from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And in total, we have about 4 million spectra available in this region. The big hole that you see here is due to the fact that this part of the sky is simply not visible from the location of the telescope in New Mexico. So let's focus on the parts of the sky that have been observed. We can apply our new technique and making use of first the optical spectra that the Sloan Digital Sky Survey has observed, we can now for the very first time reveal the large scale distribution of these molecules in the sky and therefore in our galaxy. This is what we see using optical spectra and we have a second part of the project which uh, allows us to make use of infrared spectra and by combining the two we are now getting this global view of the distribution of these large molecules in the sky and in the galaxy. This is quite exciting. It's the very first time we can basically see this image. This is, those are direct observations. We are not making use of any assumptions. There is a lot of information in this map. Uh, in certain regions, we can zoom in and we have access to uh, finer details. We can look at the clumpiness uh, of this distribution. Uh, as you can see, there are all sorts of interesting features. We can see some uh, filamentary structures. We can see that these molecules are not restricted to the disk of the Milky Way, but they exist as well above the disk. We can use this path now to make all sorts of comparisons. Okay. So on the bottom here, I'm showing again uh, the distribution of small molecules. This is carbon monoxide in the galaxy. As you can see, uh, these molecules are only restricted to the plane of the Milky Way but these uh, much larger and mysterious molecules can exist even outside of the plane. They appear to be much more robust than those fragile uh, CO molecules. It seems to be as robust as these tiny little dust grains that we find in space. This is showing the distribution of these cosmic dust grains, and as you can see, there are lots of similarities between their distributions and the distribution of these mysterious molecules. So now with this new data set, we are able to study in much greater detail the relationships between these molecules and all the different ingredients of our galaxy. There is one more interesting thing about this. Uh, this map is actually not a two-dimensional map, but it turns out that we can make a 3D map of the distribution of these molecules. The signal that we are getting from the spectra allows us to measure the amount of molecules as well as um, their velocity from Doppler shift measurements. So we can actually come up with a 3D uh, map of the distribution. And what I'm showing here, focusing now just on the plane of our Milky Way, I'm using a color coding that is showing us the velocity of these molecules. So when we see red, it's telling us that the molecules are moving away from us, and when it is blue, they are coming towards us. So this is a whole new type of information that we did not have access to before and allows us to connect the motion, the global motion of these molecules in the galaxy to the, the overall dynamics of the Milky Way. This is extremely interesting and we are going to start uh, understanding this new data. So to summarize, we have been able with these new data analysis techniques to come up with a new data set. Uh, it's very rich, it's a 3D map, it has thousands of pixels, it allows us to look at this global distribution of the mysterious molecules, as well as their small-scale structure. Uh, we can get information about the galactic center, we can get information about the outer disk, we have information on their velocity, and the good news is that uh, in the near future, the fourth component of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey is going to move to the southern hemisphere and will give us data for this hole that we currently have in the map. So in the near future, we will be able to come up with a map that is going to be almost complete over the entire sky. So to summarize, uh, with this new uh, project, we have been able, just using new algorithms, we have been able to extract a new type of information from millions of spectra that were available to compile and create this new 3D map showing us the distribution of these mysterious molecules. This is very exciting because this was one of the dark corners of astronomy. We had very little observations, very little data from observations, and as I explained before, from a theoretical point of view, this is also the regime where the calculations are the most difficult. Therefore, having this new map is really going to be fantastic to better understand what these molecules are, where they come from, and how they evolve. I'm very glad today to say that we are now releasing this map. It's available on the web, and soon we are going to release the corresponding data sets so astronomers around the world can now make use of this data in their own explorations of the Milky Way. Thank you.
Oops. Should be one way to remember off. There it is. There. Yeah. Okay. Let's see the first slide. All right, so this is a speculative idea that I hope one day might be found out in the cosmos. Um, so the title is Flashes from Faster Than Light Spots That Might Help Illuminate uh, Astronomical Secrets. Um, so um, let's start out with, uh, uh, it's hard to, this is a bit of a, a brain twister. So it, I've had a success trying to bring people up to speed with this by asking three questions. So at your seats, think the answers to these three questions in the series. So the first question is, um, Let's say you had a, a laser and a dome. Now, I realize the web audience can't see it, but this is a laser pointer. Uh, so let's say you had a dome. Let's say that's the room. So you shine a laser on a distant spherical dome that's one light year away. So now picture the, the walls of this room and the uh, ceiling of this room is one light year away. So you take your laser and you rotate it from your left, I'll, let's say to your right, um, in one second. Uh, so one year later on the dome, how fast does the spot on that dome move? So you think about that. The three answers, possible answers are it moves slower than the speed of light C, it moves at C, or it moves faster than C. Okay? So there'll be no quiz, but the answer actually is faster than C, which is counterintuitive to some people. So after waiting one year for the spot to appear on the dome, um, you see the spot move 180 degrees around in one second, which is uh, pi light years um, per second. Uh, so, however... Special relativity is not being violated, and no locally produced information is being communicated faster than C. <laughs> On to the second question. Okay, so this is the laser in the wall. So you shine a laser parallel to a wall, an infinite planar wall. Okay, you then rotate the laser toward the wall with a constant angular speed. And the question is, where does the laser first illuminate the wall? So I know the web audience can't see it, but let's say this screen was the wall, and here's a laser pointer. So first you start uh, there, and then you rotate at constant angular speed, and then eventually it comes to the, the nearest point. So is the first place illuminated infinitely far out on the wall? Is it uh, the point nearest the laser, or is it somewhere in between? So you can contemplate that for a little bit. And the answer is, oddly enough, somewhere in between. It's not A, it's not infinitely far out on the wall, because it takes an infinite amount of time for the light to go infinitely far out on the wall. So that point way out on the wall is only going to be illuminated way in the future. It's not the closest point, because you just saw the point just before it was illuminated before that. Therefore, the first point on the wall illuminated, when you move your laser pointer like that, is somewhere between the closest point and infinity. Okay. Here's the hardest one. Does the spot, after it reaches its first point, uh, move uh, mostly toward the laser or away from the laser? Okay, so it's had some intermediate point. What does the spot do? Does it move here or does it move out there? Uh, a is toward the laser, B is away from the laser, and C is both toward and away from the laser. Now, it took me a long time to get this right, and uh, so I'm not expecting people uh, uh, to get it or get it right away, but... Um, the answer is, oddly enough, both toward and away from the laser. Actually, what happens is there's two laser spots created, one moving toward the observer, the other moving away from the observer. Okay, so that is what's called a spot pair creation event. It has to be that way because the way out on the wall, that's got to be illuminated late. So if it's, it's not the first point, then one of those is, is illuminated at the same time as someone near, and those two are illuminated at the same time. And therefore, what you do is you see a spot pair creation event. Now, this, you can call the spot pair creation event a photonic boom because it is very analogous to a sonic boom. All right? uh, each spot starts very bright, so you start with a flash, and then it dims. Okay, so here's what an observer would see. They would first see, as you turn your laser toward the wall, a uh, pair of bright spots appear at the first place. Uh, uh, each spot uh, moves away from the other. One spot moves, uh, they each are they're born moving infinitely fast. Each spot slows and fades. One spot moves past you, and the other spot moves out to infinity, and eventually they both go out to infinity. So actually, when you turn your laser toward the wall, there, there's um, always two spots. Counterintuitive. Okay, but we don't have to stop with infinite wall. Infinite walls are expensive and hard to, uh, hard to maneuver, so let's bring it into a sphere. And there are local spheres nearby, one you might have heard of called the moon. Okay, so this is uh, 
uh, conceptually very similar to the um, wall sweep, but it's done with, uh, with uh, any sphere or the moon. So um, what happens is, you know, have a, here is your basic moon, and let's say here is your laser pointer there, on, on there, the, the red circle. And so then, the, as you sweep your laser across the moon, that's going to be the first point on the moon illuminated. And what's going to happen is there's going to be a, a pair of, of um, spots. It's going to break into two. One of them is going to move toward the closest limb, and the other is going to move across. And uh, so the one that moves across is approximately the same brightness, and eventually it disappears. So is this hard to do? Can you make a pair of spots on the moon? To do that, to make it, to make it obvious, you'd have to sweep your laser near the speed of light. So who could move the laser pointers to have a spot on the moon moving with the speed of light? Well, anybody can. All you have to do is move the, your laser pointer from horizon to horizon in about four seconds, being sure to conclude the moon in the middle. When you do that, there will be a pair creation event, uh, actually somewhat a quarter of the way across the moon at the first illumination point, and then that will be the first, actually, uh, light observed. Okay, uh, this, these photonic booms, I think, are more than just theoretical curiosities. I think they might be observable out in the universe, and I think they might tell us stuff. Um, they, first of all, their, their candidate systems to see this include the moon. Uh, passing asteroids might be swept with, uh, with lasers, powerful lasers, not laser pointers. Um, variable nebula might show this without us having to do anything because they have um, shadows and spots that move on them, sometimes uh, faster than the speed of light. Um, pulsars have beams. There are other astronomical systems that are candidates. Uh, here's a fancy picture of Hubble's Variable Nebula, um, appropriately taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. So what happens is the, um, this region here changes in erratic fashion, and there are bright and dim spots that move about in this region and in ways that aren't predicted. So the, the variability of Hubble's Variable Nebula is not well predicted. So I actually have a student looking for patterns in there, although we can't say anything definitive at this time. Okay, why would anyone do this? Well, there's potentially recoverable information. Uh, if you analyze the, the, the details of this effect, you can get, you find out that when the radial speed toward the observer drops from superluminal to subluminal, that's when you get a paracreation event. So if you're looking at an object out in the cosmos and you see a paracreation event, you now know something about the radial velocity of the spot that you didn't know before. So there's a new information entering the system. If you know the sweep speed by other means, uh, across the angular sweep speed by other means, then you will have both a angular velocity and a radial velocity, which will give you the orientation of the scattering surface. So that is other information that you might not have had before. If you have, and this would get complicated, some other key pieces of information, then you might, this might be a component in getting distances uh, to any number of objects. Uh, so. Uh, this was a poster that was actually yesterday, and that's the title of the poster. This uh, work is uh, accepted and in press at the Astronomical Society of Australia. Um, so uh, it is available on archive uh, now. You can just uh, click on that link. And here is a quick summary. Uh, superluminal pair events, yeah, I think, surely exist out in the cosmos. Uh, they've been dubbed photonic booms because they're analogous to sonic booms. They may be discoverable, although none have yet been discovered, uh, for one reason, because no one has looked. Um, they may help provide new information, including radial sweeping speeds, surface orientation, and object distance information. So that's what I got for you. Thank you. All right, quite an interesting collection of results to talk about. Uh, the way this works is we will take questions from the room and then we'll go to the webcast and take questions from there. Uh, Deputy Press Officer Larry Marshall has the mic, so if you want the mic, please raise your hand and wait for Larry to bring it to you and then identify yourself by name and affiliation. We have a couple questions over here. We'll start with Martin. Is that Martin Radcliffe, uh, freelance Bruce, uh, could you explain a little bit of your te uh, new technology that you did for determining your DIVs? Okay, so there are different um, layers, um, but the main idea is that we are approaching the problem more statistically. Instead of looking at one star at a time, one spectrum at a time, 
we make use of information that we have from the collection of all the stars and all the spectra in the data set. So this is a much richer type of information, and by using it uh, with a statistical approach, we are actually the, we have a much uh, better ability to understand which of the wiggles are due to the stars and which are due to these molecules. Uh, if it's all right, I have a question for Adam and then for Robert. Um, Cal Cofield of space.com. Adam, I'm wondering if you can tell me what makes the system less than perfect and if there are actually physical, uh, you know, astronomical elements specifically that, that give the, the system problems. So one of the issues is that the data that we trained on, the spectroscopy, does not itself provide perfect measurements of the temperature, the surface gravity, or the size, and the heavy element contents. So there's some uncertainty from those measurements, which is then propagated through to our measurement as well. Um, the, another issue is that uh, at the moment we only have 9,000 stars, which doesn't provide a fully representative sample of everything that you might find uh, within the full population of variable stars. So if we were to have a, a more representative sample, some of that uh, scatter, those uncertainties should become smaller. And the same is true if we were to have more precise spectroscopic measurements, which we use during the training phase. Um, and Robert, I don't know if you can, how much detail you can go into, but um, I didn't quite follow you to the point of having two spots appear. Can, can you explain that again quickly? Okay, why are there two spots? Yes, that's, that's difficult to, to assess, assess to, to explain. Well, as the laser pointer, the, since it's the first point, if you drag the laser pointer at constant angular speed toward a wall, if it's not originally pointing at the wall, uh, the first point it goes to on the wall will not be infinitely far away because it takes like an infinite amount of time to go that far away. It won't be the closest point because the point to the left of it is going to be eliminated. So it's going to be in the middle. But then both the infinite far away points, the very far away points and the local points have to be illuminated at some time. If they're not illuminated right in the beginning, they must be illuminated later. And it turns out you just match up pairs of them. And that's why there is a pair creation event because the, the first one is in the middle. And so the other ones have to be eliminated eventually, and you just pair them up. Is that clear? OK, uh, Steve Marin, I think, was next. Boss, do you have one, too? OK. Steve Marin, Astronomy for Dummies. <laughs> Masikoff gave himself a plug. For Dr. Uh, Maynard, uh, there have been, I think, many endless papers about what the DIVs might be, or the substance that produced them, That's right. has your uh, excellent new data set lead you to believe that it favors or disfavors any particular notable theory? No, so we, we don't know yet uh, which theory or which uh, candidate molecule is going to be responsible or is responsible for the diffusion of the bands. Um, but the main message uh, of this work is that we now have a much, much richer data set, which is telling us where those molecules are distributed in the galaxy. Uh, and as I said, this is a 3D map, uh, so there is a lot of information. And now we are very hopeful in uh, trying to use all this information to have a much better idea of what uh, the carrier of this uh, future really is. Okay, we have a question way in the back, boss. Put your hand up so Larry can find you. <laughs> this is a, a follow-up for Dr. Namirov on, the, on these spots. Um, I think I, I get why there will, will be two spots if you uh, rotate the laser. Uh, what I don't get is what, where the, uh, the hallowed value of C comes in. You, you could have the same reasoning with a, with a stream of bullets, I think. Um, so it did occur to me that my, maybe you just uh, mentioned superluminal spots, uh, spots moving superluminally because it, it will attract attention. Uh, but maybe uh, uh, you can disabuse me of that. On the other hand, if I'm right, then maybe there will be other phenomena, sound waves, radiation, uh, whatever, that, that might exhibit the same spot creating behavior. Okay, well... It's analogous to a sonic boom, which you don't get unless a plane goes faster than the speed of sound. So the way this works, though, is that for an observer, the, you see the pair creation event when the spot drops from superluminal to subluminal. 
So that's where C directly comes in. It is at that exact place where, where the um, pair creation event happens. So C is related to it. And if you couldn't go faster than C, then you wouldn't get that. That said, that's for a flat plane. If you have a curved, like a sphere, then the speed on the sphere of a spot that gets near the edge on the sphere actually diverges, which is why you get a pair creation event on a sphere. And I understand it took me a while to figure this out, and I kept making mistakes and like going, duh. But uh, I I'm happy to talk about it in some detail. It's, it's, it's very simple on some level, but it gets kind of complicated on other levels. It's fun, though, to think about. The main thing is... with a stream of bullets. I don't completely understand that. I think since bullets are all subluminal, I would say no, but I may not completely understand your question. I think what he's asking is if you were to start firing a machine gun parallel to an infinite wall and then start sweeping to the wall, would you have the same kind of phenomenon occurring at the points where the bullets are hitting the wall? OK. Um, I don't think so, but I'd have to think that through. I don't think you can, I don't think that would be. I'll think that through. Though. This is a, a rare case where I'm going to suggest that we not try the experiment. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions in the room? Did you have one over here? No? Larry, did you have a question yourself? Yes, a, a question for Bob. Um, can you uh, speak at all to uh, any quantum mechanical interpretations of this, and is there anything to do with entanglement? And these pairs that seem to be moving up. I think it's quantum mechanics free, unfortunately. Um, it's just a, it's a geometric event that's, com that's, uh, that's related to special relativity but is mostly classical. It's just straight lines involved and no, no entanglement, so far as I can tell. Do we have any questions on the webcast? Okay, well, I wrote down a list of questions, so I'll once again uh, take advantage of the uh, moderator's prerogative and ask a few questions. So my first one's for Adam Miller uh, concerning the, uh, the actual observations that you are training your machine, your computer to understand. Are they just white light broadband uh, brightness measurements or do you have uh, color information as well? Uh, what, basically, what are the observations you're using? Sure. So the the light curves that we were using were produced by the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, and Sloan observed in five passbands, mm -hmm. uh, covering essentially the full optical portion of the spectrum. So we used the light curves produced in each of those passbands. So there is color information in the light curves themselves. The same will be true when the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope produces light curves for everything in the southern sky. They'll be observing in six filters, and so they will also have color information in addition to the light curves themselves. Okay, that was what I was hoping you would say, because that leads to my follow-up question, which is, is there anything in the patterns that, you're, that the computer can look for that might be analogous to the kinds of, uh, you know, astronomers will use photometric observations in different colors of extragalactic systems to try to estimate redshifts. Is there any analogous uh, information in the multicolor light curves to give you any kind of velocity information that would further help, you know, characterize. I mean, you'd get. You talked about having low resolution spectra. If you could get any kind of velocity information too, it would uh, turn your maps into 3D maps. Okay, so you're specifically asking about line of sight velocity to yeah. the stars yeah. themselves. Um, Something in the pattern of the. If there's any way that the light curves are different in different colors, and whether that is there's anything analogous to that extragalactic effect. Right. Uh, so the the short answer is I don't believe that there would be any way to do that just from the photometry for stars in our galaxy. Okay. Um, typically, you take you take a spectrum to measure that, but that's a property that essentially is unique to a spectrum. I don't think our new method would be able to recover that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, a question for uh, Dayton. Um, it it sounds like you you know the position of Saturn now, or the very center of the Saturn system, a billion miles away to within a mile. What level of precision did we have before this project, before the VLBA was turned on Cassini? Uh, okay, the, the measurements we're able to make with the VLBA are about a factor of 20 better than what was uh, possible using uh, 
optical and other historical measurements. Um, the, the VOBA is unique in that there are other there are other radio telescopes in the world that are used for very long baseline interferometry, but the VOBA was designed and built specifically and only for that kind of observing. So it is more stable, better calibrated, has a better range of baselines, and consequently you just get much more precise measurements uh, from the VOBA than you do from other random collections of radio telescopes. Okay, and a question for Brees, after I apologize for calling you Bryce at the beginning. Um, there must be in addition to theoretical arguments for what, the, the, what are the sources of these diffuse interstellar bands, there must be some kind of intensive laboratory effort being made to, you know, to produce similar bands uh, from dusty molecules or, or just big molecules that you might expect should be in space. What's the status of that? That's right. So yes, people have tried very hard in the lab for several decades now in trying to uh, manufacture these tiny little molecules, look at uh, their absorption spectra and try to compare that to astronomical observations. But so far, nobody has been able to create in the lab the same types of molecules leading to the same type of observational signatures. Mm -hmm. So there has been a complete disconnect. People have not been able to succeed so far in trying to connect what we observe in the galaxy with what we see in the lab. And you had mentioned that early studies of the DIBs focused on very hot stars that showed very weak absorptions, and that your newer technique gives you access to all kinds of stars. Is, is the difference there just the fact that the Sloan survey has produced so many high quality spectra of so many different types of stars, or is there some other technique you are applying here? No, so as, as, as I was uh, pointing out earlier, it's not about the data, it's about the way we uh, analyze the data. Mm. We are not um, processing the spectra one by one, ignoring the rest of the data sets. We are having a global approach, trying to make to understand the, the common properties of all these spectra. And once we have done that, we are in a much better position to tell which of the wiggles belong to certain stars and which of them belong to these mysterious molecules that are in front of them. Okay. And then fi finally, I have one for Robert. Um, if we just think about trying to, to test this idea on the moon, um, how powerful a laser would you need? And for example, would the lasers that are being used for laser guide star work be sufficiently powerful? And if you could sweep such a laser across the moon fast enough, uh, are there detectors with enough time resolution to be able to see the effect? Well, I haven't studied that in detail. I think there are lasers powerful enough. I think that someone actually tried a laser sweep on the moon. There are, of course, two reflectors left by Apollo mm -hmm. that could test part of this quite simply. But I. I haven't worked the numbers. My impression is that you could probably do it, and the detectors wouldn't be the problem. The laser power would be the problem. Okay. Okay. I know we have another question in the room here, Steve. Uh, I note that those two those two reflectors have to be on the same line. Yes. <laughs> uh, for, for Dr. Jones, when uh, Juno uh, gets to the Jupiter vicinity next year, and you're going to refine the ephemeris with these future VLBA observations, what is the main benefit of so doing? Is it purely to be a little more precise in your maneuvering within the Jupiter system or other targeting of spacecraft? Or is there going to be some kind of science that comes out of it, some better way to detect the wobbles in, inside Saturn or one of its moons? What, what's the motivation? The, the real motivation is that the planetary ephemeris is a fundamental tool of astronomy in the same sense as star catalogs and galaxy catalogs are. But there's a lot of science that is based on the ephemeris, and so the process of continuing to maintain and improve the, the overall ephemeris of our solar system has been going on for centuries, and this is just one more step in that unending process. So that's in the sense of correcting stellar or other observations way they're affected by motions of the observer or the system to which they can. Uh, are, are you asking about gravitational deflection experiments? I'm not completely <laughs> clear. Yeah, my bad. No, I just, I just mean, you know, when you observe pulsars, which I used to do, yes. you have to correct the observations for the, uh, uh, the motion of the Earth with respect to the Barry Center and, and the rate at which your observatory is turning on the Earth and all that. Yes. And you do that to some extent in stellar spectroscopy and 
no doubt other things. And uh, is that what you meant when it's the planetary ephemeris is fundamental to everything we do in astronomy? Yeah, that's a good example. Exactly right. Pulsar time is dependent on a very good model of, of the Earth's orbital motion. But since the Earth is gravitationally linked to every other massive body in the solar system, you only really know that well when you have a global solution for all of the dynamics of the solar system. Inga, have any questions come in on the web since I started my long list? Okay. Well, if we have no further questions, um, we'll bring this briefing to a close. I want to thank again our four speakers for four very interesting, uh, thought-provoking uh, presentations. Normally at this time, at the end of the last briefing at the winter meeting, I announce the uh, date, time, and location of the first briefing of the summer meeting. But as you may have noticed from the signage in the convention center, there is no summer AAS meeting in 2015. Instead, the AAS is hosting the 29th General Assembly of the International Astronomical Union in Honolulu. And so I will not be putting press conferences together for that because it's an IAU meeting. It's not a AAS meeting. But the IAU will be putting press conferences together, and so there will be um, astronomy news happening in Honolulu in August, and then the next AAS meeting will be the 227th meeting in Kissimmee, Florida, which is near Orlando, uh, in the first week of January 2016. And so that's where our next AAS press conference will be, and I hope that you will all plan to be there. Thank you very much. We appreciate this, uh, the very uh, strong attendance at all our briefings this week. And now, signing off from Seattle, this is Rick Feinberg from the AAS saying, see you next year. Thank you.